Green is the new gold. Our 18-hole Niklaus design, award-winning golf course and clubhouse will leave you green with envy. We don't just say, we do. It's the Stain City way. Good afternoon and welcome to Real Talk right here on SABC3. I am your host, Anel M. Doda. Until further notice. Now, I want to ask you something. If you were given the opportunity of spending one day, just one day playing someone else, who would it be? Well, whatever your answer is, my guest today gets to do that all the time because she's an actress, but even better than that, she is the first woman to play a man so convincingly on Mzanti television that she had a lot of women on that hashtag thirst track. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, hey, you gentlemen over there. Listen, I must introduce Charlene Chetza Kudzai Mende, who we've all come to know as She Mende. And to those of you who still haven't figured out who I'm talking about, I am talking about the dashing young bachelor, Wandi Lekhadebe, who's on Generations The Legacy. Welcome. Hello. Listen, I'm so glad you were excited to come here because as soon as the team told me you're coming, I was like, yo, I, I have to talk to her. Well, I am equally excited to actually be touching you physically. Let's do it, too. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> first things first. So you play a guy, right? Well, now a transitioned, transgender, transgender. woman. Transgender. Yeah. Okay. We're going to talk about that because it must be... Because you're kind of like the poster boy. It's like you're the person who's whole... And it's quite a... A heavy topic do you know what i'm yeah, saying yeah especially in, in our country where you know there's violence towards transgender yeah. so heavy gonna, and important yeah, heavy and important we'll yeah. discuss that later but you've got a deep voice mm -hmm. now i've got a deep voice because of bad decisions but <laughs> <laughs> like you obviously this role was fitting because did you always have a voice like that yeah the role was fitting because i think of my androgynous nature okay male female looks yeah but my voice sort of broke when i was 13. my mother's got quite a husky okay. sexy voice deepish voice but i've been doing voiceovers and working on my voice for the last four to five years All so right. it has become a lot richer and a lot deeper and like a mo lot more rounded yeah and i can train it to even go way deep and uh, a lot higher <laughs> oh gee you are like a real thespian <laughs> oh, like, i love it like really so how was the audition like for generations when you went did you know that you're going to uh, you're going to audition as a girl but you know playing a boy or were they looking for a boy when you walked in they were like wait a minute you know forget that vibe so people ask me this all the time. How, why would you choose this role? Firstly, actors don't choose any role. Yeah. These are the roles that we walk into this work yeah. and we are fortunate to be given the, whatever work we get. Um, but what actually happened was that they, the brief did state that they were the character was transgender okay. and that they were looking for and that the character was male to begin with okay. and that the character was going through sexual sensitivities oh. so that's as much as we got and obviously knowing where the journey would be so mm. i knew the character was male from the beginning and they looked at both men and women so men for the who role. look like girls and and girls who have, who have that androgynous feel yeah they even looked at twins they looked at people who could tell the story in both ways they needed the first year of Wandile as the boy, yeah. then the rest of Wandile transitioning, the different stages, until we finally see Wandile like Chi. <laughs> you, you know, th that is divine because how, how blessed are they as Generations the Legacy to be looking for that and then find somebody who's a trained actress who then looks like you? Yeah, who could go into both. You could go into both. And I mean, I think we were both lucky. Yeah, yeah, like I think that is proper. So you're right. You're supposed to be on Generations. That, that, that then is your calling. Yes, I'm supposed to be on Generations. I think I'm supposed to be performing and telling. I like to go into quite challenging roles. I like mm. to go into anything that is, uh, that's the nature of an artist, of an actress. Yeah. Anything that is outside of myself. Mm. I can't ever claim to... No, know. Mm, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I like to know more than myself and more about other people, other cultures, other sexualities. Yeah. So this was a dream come true. I, I was reading some when you said that, you know, you like the physicalization 
yeah. of what happens, the transformation yeah. that happens. How long does it take you to transform from Chi to Wandile, physically yeah. and and obviously and emotionally vocally. and you know mentally? Well. I loved playing the boy. So <laughs> I always talk about this. I just, I had so much fun playing it, the boy. I, well, I actually have to like move. Like I just, because he was in me so much. Um, he still lives in me, but you know, he is now she. But the transformation for the boy took about, you know, you arrive on set about an hour before. Mm. So it took a solid hour, say 30 minutes. Yeah. I do a 20 minute vocal warm up. And then I would get strapped. Yeah, to put all the tidbits down. To put all the bits know, away. Put it in, put it in. And then I had not special underwear, nothing that was hanging per se, but I wore boxes. I asked for boxes just so that I could feel the fabric. I also heard you ask for bigger clothes, like baggy clothes, for bigger so you shoes. could get the swag on. Yeah, bigger clothes was the choice of the costume department because obviously they had to hide everything, uh -huh. um, as one would with a pregnant woman, mm. just to keep things away. So to hide the woman, they had to put bigger boy clothes. Mm. And I, st I suppose because he was young. When he arrived, he was a 19-year-old character. You know, the hip-hop look is yeah. funky, it's fresh. And so I had bigger clothes. What I did ask for were bigger shoes. Yes. I asked for a size bigger than my own, X uh. amount. <laughs> <laughs> but I asked for a bigger size because you know, I'm tight and feeling cheese foot. Mm. There's no way I would have been able to flow in that mm. swag. And then, so there was the strapping, the underwear, and so it would be a, so about 30 minutes Cologne, an hour. Cologne, did you go for like the odor to the side, like the men's side? I see side. you read that one. <laughs> <laughs> I had a special diesel cologne, actually. Oh, look at you. That I learned this from a senior actress that she would always give a scent to her characters. And so I thought that it would be fitting, far away from, you know, the floral, sweet sense oh. of femininity. Have you ever watched Revolutionary Road with Leonardo and Kate Winslet? Yes, I have. He, when he was getting interviewed for that, because he plays a normal man who lives on a cul-de-sac and he's very far from who Leonardo is, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. He married the normal girl, they live in a normal house, he's got a normal job and he eats normal food. Yeah. And he said that when he was doing Marvin's Room with Meryl Streep as a 13-year-old, she yeah. told him the first thing you must do when you get into a character is wear the character's clothes, even when you're rehearsing. Yeah. So, like, is, is, is that where it is? Because once in the, you're in their clothes, you become who they are. The first director I ever worked with in the theatre said to me, it starts in the shoes, oh. which is why I made that request. Because once you feel the shoes that you're standing on, you feel the character. And the clothes are right. And so that's why it's always a bit odd if you work in a space where people want to play with your character's clothes. Mm. I really don't like that. People think it's a bit of a, a, <laughs> a, an actor's snobbish kind of thing. By all means, call me an actor snob. Uh. I will be that person because I think it's sacred. It's such sacred work. And I think a lot of people, it is fun yeah. what we do. But I think a lot of people take for granted just how deep we have to take ourselves, remove ourselves from ourselves in order to portray what yeah. seems like so much fun. We meditate to go into that space, into that mind. And when I speak about the fabric, I ask for boxes. Now 1D, as we know her, yeah. as the trans girl, wears softer feminine clothes. The minute those clothes were put on me, I struggled a bit because I thought, oh, well, I've been playing a boy for a year. I, I don't know how to be feminine and pretend to have male organs. Now I feel the yeah. fabric. Now, yeah. so, and so these are all bits that we take um, as our ritual. I am so fascinated. I am so fascinated. We have to take a quick break, but stay tuned for more She Mende right here on Real Talk with me, Anele. I am extremely fascinated. And welcome back to Real Talk with me, Anele. My guest today is the beautiful, talented, and I'm learning quite wise. Uh, she Mende, who describes her role as Wandile as a dream come true and the absolute point and purpose of her existence as a storyteller. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. And it's so funny because this weekend I was I was binge watching, you know, all the spiritual lessons that Oprah has. So yes, like yes, yes, yes. Binging on that because yeah. I was like in bed all weekend. And there's a guy called Gary Zukav, and he said that power is when your personality meets your soul okay have a think about it have a think about it power when your personality meets your, your soul your soul like your soul is obviously what makes you happy yeah and then it comes together then it, it comes together yeah, so yeah, when your yeah. personality meets your soul that's when 
you know, are powerful. Do you feel powerful? Are you on the way to feeling powerful? I feel I'm walking into my power. Oh. Yeah. I feel nice. like I'm, I've been blessed to mm. have my work acknowledged mm. and have my soul acknowledged. And mm. so now I'm, I feel like I'm working with it and walking with it into the purpose. And I mean, I said we're going to touch on it. So now you're playing a transgender person on Generations, right? Yeah. And obviously, you know, I, South Africa, it's a strange thing that we're going through. Yeah. And I just feel like it's because now we know about it and we hear about it, but I feel like it's been happening forever where, you know, lesbians are being killed and gay people are, are victimized and transgender people. It's like, freak, we don't understand you. I mean, even I once made a comment in radio and I was like, you know, wrapped on the knuckles about it and I apologized so quickly. I'm like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Do you feel like you are the poster child for that now? And do, are people writing you and coming up to you to talk about their struggles as transgender people? I do. I do feel some sort of poster child yeah. uh, responsibility. I have always said from the very beginning that I'm not an authority on trans, oh. so I will never declare that I have all the answers. Mm. But what I am 100% is a full supporter, 100% mm. behind, 100% activist. I am ashamed of people who keep things narrow, who, oh. who consider just one sexuality and one, one story. I could, could even get a little emotional, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just that I just don't think it's, it's fair. Yeah. It's the same thing as how we discuss tribalism and, yeah. and racial awareness. Just, yeah. just as black as you can be black or white or Chinese, Indian, whatever, we mm. are different in our bodies and that needs to be acknowledged too. Mm. So I think that's where I feel the responsibility mm. and people writing to me, they do. And that's exciting. And I'm like, yay you, yay come out. Mm. And it's not necessarily trans people who write yeah. to me. I have heterosexual females writing to me and heterosexual males writing to me about how you just make me feel good in my skin oh. because you're a woman who likes to rock your converse. Yeah, you don't yeah, feel any strain yeah. about how you must appear, how you must display. And that's important to me. That makes me feel like, you know, I think we all think when we're in this kind of position, people think that we've arrived. Yeah. That we know yeah. who we are. And that you forget that, you, that you, they forget that you're, you're grateful every day. Exactly. Right? And you're also, you're discovering. Yeah. I'm also on the journey of, on, of discovery. Oh, I love that. Because yeah. I feel like people get famous and then everything is a motivational then talk you know like, everything. Hey, it's okay like <laughs> it's okay to know nothing it, it really it is. is it's important to know, know nothing because you're just like no don't yeah. don't leave Please learn it. just do it. you said your mother was very spiritual and your dad was very hard working yeah is that what forms because i mean people watching you know people always want to know how is she so confident? You know, where did it come from? You, you have to have been raised in a specific kind of household to be this open, to yeah. be this curious, yes, curious, and to be this, as I said, wise. So what's, who is it? Is it mom? Is it dad? Is it them together tag teaming on Chi there? Nice words. I like that curiosity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's a tag team effort. Uh. And... I know, I, I, where, what camera am I on? I actually just have to look directly into camera because I know my parents maybe not, may not be watching at the moment because they're in Zimbabwe, but I know they'll watch it on YouTube. Mm. I just, I have to give them a shout out. I have oh. to give Zimbabwe a shout out. I have to give everyone who is a part of my family and a part of my growth a shout out right now. It's just important, but it was a tag team effort. It was my entire family, my mother and all her brothers and oh. my father and all his brothers, but together the two of them, I don't know if parents sit together and conference about how they want to raise their children, but I feel like they did. Uh. I feel like they talked. I was their first child together as their unit. Uh -huh. And because, you know, as a family, there will always uh, be- Somebody brought a little something extra. <laughs> they're, 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 they're greater parts <laughs> of the family and, and, and wonderful parts of the family. But as their first part of the unit, mm. I was my dad's little girl, mm. and he was excited. I was his chiedza, his light, and chiedza. I don't think they knew what they were going to do with that. And then I started talking. Oh. And very early, I was, one of my first words was penis, actually. Oh, wow. Yes. At which age? <laughs> I was two. And Somebody was saying it. <laughs> and I was just very fascinated, like in Freudian terms, I think when I started studying psychology and learning about character, 
I used to say to my teachers that I felt that I had penis envy, oh. which is a Freudian term that comes from development um, in age, between the ages zero to six. Mm. You start to develop yourself sexually yeah. and you start to know that you are a woman and mm. you fall and under the boy, woman. And, and that's, that's a, a boy. winky and that's, you and, know. And also as a woman, we don't know these words specifically, but as a woman having the organ that's penetrated that mm. we are the submissive ones so all of those bits start to make sense to us during those mm. uh, stages mm. so i was about two three and i was knowing <laughs> i was feeling the difference <laughs> and i just could feel the power of the difference yeah. and my mom my aunt actually said to me that when she first met me she's my mom's brother's wife when yes. she first met me she said, um, I came up to her and I went, do you have a winky like my daddy? Oh. <laughs> and she my poor parents, they're probably like, well, I'm not taking you mm, anywhere. Mm, mm. But I, I think the fact that they laughed, obviously, but they weren't, I was never reprimanded for wanting to know things. So that's where the curiosity stayed. And they accepted yeah. that. And my parents took me to parties with them as a child. I spent time with them. I... And you know, children who grow up with older people, they, 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 they are mature treated quickly. like, they mature yeah. quickly, they're treated like adults. And so I think they supported that. They had great friends that were part of the parental yeah. bit as well that raised me and friends who weren't ashamed of who they were. You know, growing up in the 80s, growing up post-colonization, mm. post I can't yeah. even imagine what it was like, you know, uh, growing up during apartheid time, but if my parents were here, they'd probably be wanting to engage mm -hmm. and really wanting to overcome whatever struggle. You know what I liked? I watched an interview of yours and they asked you to, they're going to say one word and you must give the immediate thought that comes to your mind. And they said, Robert Mugabe. And you said, master, lordful, amazing. <laughs> and for me, I was just like, yes, guys. Okay. Yeah, okay. Say what you want about <laughs> Robert Mugabe, but this is your president. Like, mm -hmm. you know, even we want to be like, spicy about our guy but yeah. at the end of the day that's our guy you know and for me i liked it showed pride in yeah. being zimbabwe yeah it showed pride in growing up in zimbabwe and also you know we can't discount the fact that uh zimbabweans are very educated he is the reason and yeah. he is the reason he is the of reason. that so do you do you find yourself constantly having to like protect your your old bob there like ah guys leave my guy alone I think nationality is something that ah. people just always talk about mm. and talking about who you are and where you're from. And I am proud wherever I go in the world of mm. who I am and the people who raised me. Okay, don't stop that. Listen, on the other side of the break, apparently at the age four, she had like an eye patch. Something happened and she had an eye patch. Oh. <laughs> We're gonna talk all about that when we return. Stay with us. So before we get back to our guest here on Real Talk, remember to enter the at-home competition for a chance to win yourself 5,000 rand uh, worth of goodies. That's an e-gift card from at home. Just follow the instructions on the screen to enter and the winner will be announced this Friday. It could be you. Yeah, I'm talking to you. If you just joined us, with us in studio is actress Shi Mende. Four years old, you went for an op. You were fixing your eyes. Yes. Where did you get this information? Because I'm just like... I don't think I've ever shared that with anyone, yeah. for it to be out. Yeah, it's out, because you were like, you said it's your party trick that you can squint your eyes. Can you still do it? I can. Do you want me to do it to camera? Yeah, do it to camera. Okay, so this is eyes normal, and then... <gasps> Yo! <laughs> <laughs> you could have played Marlena in Days of Our Lives. I, cause she's actually my inspiration. <laughs> really? She, like, I mean, she's what... I, who, who did not grow up on Marlena? Which was, which was possessed. The possession was made, what made me realize how deep I could go. Really? And then Father Francis and all of that. And then Celeste and the lady in the white dress. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, that's where you could go. So re why did you become an actress? Because I know when you were seven years old, you were in kind of like a theatre group. Like that's where the love kind of started. So when I was seven, I joined the speech and drama group at school. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, this is cool. And I don't know if it was my decision or if it was my parents' decision. I just know I had to choose activities at school uh -huh. but I was very shy as a child the little girl who partied with her parents and went to places 
I think was their way of trying to get me out, but oh. also I was very close to my mom. I had my finger in my mouth. I was very oh. shy, so it might have been their way of trying to get me to talk because when I did public speaking for the first time, I, if you can believe how a black girl can go yellow or pale, <laughs> it can be pale. You just that lost was all my the blood day. in your face, honey. I lost all of it, and I just I couldn't speak. Uh. But over the years, with speech drama, with poetry, with language, with characters, I remember, because I went to an all-girls school, and I always talk about that that's where I got to learn and play with the male physicalization. Because you guys would do plays. We I know you did both. Angels and Demons. Angels and Demons, no. Yeah. No. When I did play a demon at oh, some okay. I played the devil. Okay. But I played Fred Flintstone when I was like in grade six. Wow. I played Jesus. Uh -huh. And, you know, some people well, might in say. In a ghost school, you still play the male roles, just that one of the ghost plays it. Yeah, unless it was a really big production, like the final year production where they'd bring in guys from the brother okay, school. Yeah. But just in to how situations we got to play everything and I've been this height and my voice has been what it's been since okay. I was 12 and I felt quite strong and I enjoyed going into different spaces you studied at AFTA in Cape Town ne? yes before you went to Cape Town to study and obviously you were from Zimbabwe had you ever been to South Africa just like to visit or to go to to, to Sun City, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I had, Cape Town was why I actually fell in love and made the choice to go to university there. Uh -huh. Because I traveled there with my mom when I was a teenager, and I said to her, this is my home, this is where I want to live. And she's like, okay, cool, you, you need to study? finish school first, mm -hmm. then come back. And so that's what I did. And so I'd, I'd visited Johannesburg, I had family in Joburg, I'd visited Cape Town uh -huh. and Plet. So I, I knew the Western Cape quite well, but I really loved Cape Town. And that's, my, my parents always encouraged being out. W worldly. Yeah. So do you know immediately, because uh, I mean, you in speech and drama by seven years old, mm. at 13 you're playing, you know, plays there in your Catholic school. Do you, do, do, is it like a toss up <laughs> when you are deciding what you're going to study? Are you like, maybe I'll be an engineer and build bridges? Or oh, I'll be a doctor and have a surgery, or I'll act. <laughs> well, until high school science, yeah. which was age 13, I thought I would be a doctor. Hey, girl. That's what I really wanted to do. We all bowed out. Then science came. <laughs> <laughs> like, when you're like 23%. Uh, ah! Yeah, or just the brain just doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't latch on. So it was when I was 13 when I decided I'm going to be an actress so that I can be a doctor. Every now and then. Every now and then. <laughs> so I can be anything, anything uh. that I want to be. I remember thinking, this way I can be anything. Uh -huh. Yeah. What do you still want to be? I know you said you want to be the president. You want to play the president. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Jeez, I feel like you're in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would be fun to play the first female president. Uh. Let us have her so that we can tell her story. Uh, so I, see, I see your hint there. So I see your hint. Well done. So <laughs> With the political climate, I think there's two women. Oh, and I'm talking about Africa as a whole. Mm. We're talking about Africa mm. as a whole. So let us get her biography. Uh -huh. Let's get her story. And if it's not her, a first lady. Okay. Um, I'm quite interested in superheroes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I agree with first lady. First ladies are yeah. interesting yeah, people. Very. Because yeah. they are the neck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turning yeah. of the head. Yeah. So let's get into some of those stories. I'd love to play a superhero. Okay, L like Black Panther vibes? <laughs> like Black Panther, I guess. The first black <laughs> African <laughs> like. superhero. But no, there's a girl, uh, like I have different voices, obviously, in the brain. And there's, um, I, I won't tell you all about her now because, you know, copyrights, mm. what, what. People will But there's a character it. I've been playing around with in the mind. And she's, um, she's quite a, an interesting character. And like, she's got a weird voice. And, and whenever there's danger, she goes, Anybody want, anybody call a doctor? <laughs> and then she runs to the situation. <laughs> and she's got a special power that I'm going to still keep, keep secret. Keep to yourself. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little dirty, but it's fun. I think it's on the Boondocks South oh, Park kind okay. of animation. Okay, I hear what you're saying. So animation. But important, fun. Hmm. When you're studying at AFTA, because here's the thing. Yeah. U universities are, are different to art campuses right yeah. because in university you, you you go you study bsc you study history you study science you study accounting you study law and never do you sit and think that you will not be an accountant 
you will not get a job as an accountant if yeah. you've got a degree. Yeah. Art campuses are something else. It's like yeah. a hub of dreams where you all go there. Yeah. And, and you're all the best of whatever space you came from. Yeah. Right. So, and you're there and you want to be, you know, a director, you want to be an actress. But at the back of your mind, you know that there, there's a very big chance that you won't get to act because, you know, you'll never walk into an audition room and the director's looking for exactly you. Yeah. How do you keep motivated going to campus every day, knowing that the chances are chances? You know, I think this is the first time I'm confronted with that fear oh. or that thought. I, it was a problem actually for my dad because he asked that question uh -huh. and he was fearing that. Yeah. I, I've never had that fear. I've just always believed that when I wake up, because I've woken up, it's going to happen. And so wait, girl, you can't you can't just drop <laughs> that and think you're gonna move on like you didn't say nothing. Okay. Say that again. Okay. When I wake up. When I wake up. Because I woke up. Because I have woken up, it has happened. And I suppose I was always odd i was always the odd one in mm. every space you you speak about my my squint eye mm. I, I wore a patch at nursery school <laughs> i didn't know what that meant i from the age of three i was always in a space where i was different mm. only when you're an adult does being different seem Meta. well then you then you know that that's it's a yeah. good thing but yeah. it's still it's still something that people think is odd yeah. When people don't, the people want you to conform. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like now I stand for non-conforming even more because of how odd I am. A now friend I'm just of mine like, says, fly the freak flag. Fly it. <laughs> fly, fly it freak, high. Fly it high. Like, the stranger you are, the better. Exactly. And so when I was at university, I think, again, I was, I was odd. I was the only Zimbabwean actress mm, there. Mm. I was coming with my own story and, mm. and my own baggage and I was just reading the books and wanting to learn. We were studying psychology, which was fascinating. Mm. I, was, I would sit in my corner trying to understand myself, trying to understand my character, trying to understand other characters. Mm. So there was no time for me to think, this won't happen. This won't happen. It was happening already. Yeah. When I wake up, because I woke up, it will happen. Ah, stolen, girl. Stolen. <laughs> <laughs> stolen. Oh, yes. Ah. Please. I We're back, and our guest today is indeed owning the stage right here on SCBC3. So you did stage work, like theatre work, right? I have been doing theatre work, and, and still, you still do it. Still, actually, yeah, I have yeah. a show coming out in November, actually. Oh, yeah. tell us about it. It's a uh, Janice Hanneman's pantomime, Pinocchio. Okay. And I will be playing Pussy Galore. Oh, Pinocchio. Yeah. So please come. Please yes. bring the young ones. Yeah, well, if you're saying it's in November, you could you can always come back here with your cast. I would know. like to. Okay, cool. Yeah, if so you'll have me. If there's We've no. got a longer couch, don't okay. worry. This oh, is yeah, just for you. Because please, can we? But we've got longer couch. Yeah, they yeah. can come out here. You guys can teach us a few things, you know. <laughs> okay. So when it comes to TV and theater, I'm not asking you to pick a great love. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you to tell me how she shines on stage and how she shines on TV. Okay. Oof. Anile. Oh, lovely question. Because people ask that question all the time, but not as deep. <laughs> um... <laughs> Uh, she shines on stage, I think, no, I know, mm -hmm. by making use of her largeness, uh -huh. her big body, her big voice, her bigness uh -huh. is the greatest thing about being on stage. Uh. All the things she knows about herself in a big way, she internalizes to make big problems uh -huh. for troubled characters to make big tears big joys mm, big moments mm. that you can only see and feel for a moment just in the eyes um that's how i become big on, on screen oh, on, on screen, on screen yes. so the bigness is internalized and it's how i it can has to tear come out here 
has to, it can only come out here. So it's how I can go into the crying roles and the tearing skin off roles mm. and like with Wandile, the cutting mm. and things like that. So that's where I will enjoy myself and my largeness on screen. But on stage, she comes alive in Even body. like the fingertips are out there. Everything, you get big hair, yeah. you can get yeah. big everything. Everything is bigger and it's fun that way. Yeah. You were a substitute teacher when you were 17 years old, right? Yeah, 17, 18. 17, 18. Yeah. Uh, had you matriculated? I had, yeah. So I finished school the year I turned 18. Uh. And then I was a grade three substitute teacher for the junior school of the school I went to. Mm. Um, for the year. I'd been a Sunday school teacher since I was 13. Uh. Um, Isn't so that in its, in, in its own way, like stage and theater and performance, like being in front of a class and having to captivate them and keep them intrigued? I think it prepared me uh -huh. for it because uh -huh. there's a patience <laughs> that is required for teaching. Yeah. That's, it's not necessary for, for stage. I think on stage you can go wild uh. um, and you can't really see. Or there are distractions, yeah. of course, um, and there have been other actors known to stop a show. Um, but with a class, with children, there's something that you have to contain. Mm. And yeah, it, it, it did prepare me mm. for the rest for, for this. of <laughs> for, 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 for this. But for my love of working with children and playing with children mm. and talking to children and educating children, um, I feel that, you know, they're... Mm. Would your parents say you were a, an old child? I know, I know you said shy, yeah. you know, but... And not old soul, like an old, like, I didn't like being young. I just wanted to drive. I wanted to have my own house. Like, so were you an old child? Did you want to be old as a child? I, I did want to be old, but I don't know if they would say I was an old child because <laughs> I was pretty childish. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty wacky, pretty weird. Yeah. But I did, I learned how to drive when I was 12. Wow. And that, that was my fun time with yeah. my mom, to yeah. go off to the stadium and learn how to drive. Um... But no, no, I wasn't, I, she wasn't ready for the responsibilities. Uh, I think, um, yeah, call oh my that's parents. That's the actress <laughs> in you. <laughs> that's the actress That's in the you. artist in me. She just wanted to keep playing. Uh, I, I definitely say to people that I am able to play because the child in me is uh, still uh, alive. There we go. And that's what I like to do. And yes, you said your mom is spiritual and your dad was a hard worker, but what professions were they in? Were they not teachers? My, da uh, my mother uh, was a teacher, uh -huh. and her mother and her father. My paternal grandfather was a teacher, uh -huh. but my father was an entrepreneur. He started working very young on the hustle. He left home as a teenager yes. and took care of his siblings and his mother and then took care of us. And so he has known how to keep things together yeah. since he was very young. And... He gave some of that to me, it, I suppose. Okay, which was my next question. When it comes to your dad, what did he teach you that you, you will not compromise? It has to be taught to your kids. Definitely that experience is the greatest teacher. Mm. That's something that he said in many different ways. Mm. It was, I first left home to live for a month in reunion on French exchange when I was 15. She I was, was 14, 15. I stayed away from home for four or five weeks. Did not miss home. Mm -hmm. And because I was encouraged to go and find myself mm. out in the world and not to hope that myself will come out we of the dining come find room. You there. Or will come find me, exactly. So my father has always been a strong believer of interactions, other people, other worlds, other cultures being the best teacher. You can't go and read a book on... France and ah. no French. Other in interactions in other countries and, and other, other people cultures. and other cultures are the best teachers in the world. They are the best teachers. Okay. Yeah. And with your mom, what did she teach you that lives in she that you know has to move on to the to the to she junior to she Mendes? <laughs> I'll start with a, a, a funny little anecdote. Okay, <laughs> I like that. That when I was younger as we do as children and i think especially as black children that you always see your mom prepare food for your father yes, yes. and then the food that comes to the children mm. um and i mean if you're fortunate enough to have a mind or someone that person makes food for you yeah and then your mom comes and makes a magical meal for your father yes or adds and to it's the on meal. a tray 
with and like, it's gonna with like a doily cloth <laughs> exactly. and the glass and the toothpick. You don't and, even know that they're trees just until like, one comes you're like, up. Wait, exactly. who? You're like, who is that? Exactly. Yeah. Who is that yeah. person? And I love why it. do they have special things? And so I always used to see this happening in the home. Mm. And because I was always up late at night, chatting to my mom, mm. marking books with her. Um, and I said to her one day, 100% serious. And I don't think I knew what it meant. And it wasn't in a homosexual way. Yeah. But what I said to her was, when I grow up, I want to be a husband. Ooh. And nothing against, not saying that there's anything wrong with being homosexual, but when I was saying it, I didn't I mean I want a wife. Yeah, you were saying, I just meant if I husbands want, get treated like this. If husbands get treated like this, I want the role of being a husband in whatever life I find. <laughs> and I think she found that quite interesting, but those words came from the way she raised me because mm. when I was a child, if I wanted something, I think I learned very quickly not to manipulate my mother because I'd say, well, Lydia can tell he's got this and uh, Kelly's got this and, uh, and, and whatever her name is, she's got this. Wouldn't it be nice if I had them too? And my mom was like, well, if that's how you feel those people got them, maybe you should just go yeah. and... Yeah, go be Lydia. Go be Lydia. Yeah. Instead, you know, the lesson was always, let me come back. Let me find my train of thought. What my mother taught me mm. was that the best things and the best version of myself can only come from myself. The best woman that I can mm. ever be can only come from myself. And that I can't ever rely on Lydia or a husband mm. to feed me, mm -hmm. to buy me colors. Mm. And that I must value love, of course, and have my husband, but that those things cannot come from that person solely. Mm. I can only be whole and I can only be rich if I can be a husband to myself. Whoa! As well. That's the lesson I learned. Whoa! She, she didn't put it in those words. Yeah, no. But you, that's the lesson yeah. I took from yeah. my mother. Okay, so on the other side of the break, you said something, somebody had asked you about, oh, your relationship, like if you don't talk about it, and you were like, yeah, you just feel like for women, it's difficult to be taken seriously as an artist as your own once they know about who you're with and who you're dating and all of that stuff. So I'm not gonna ask nothing, but I do want you to unpack that <laughs> after the break now. I'm waiting for the other side. <laughs> And welcome back to Real Talk with Anele. If you've just arrived home and tuned in, flopile, flopile. you've missed out on most of the, my time with the lovely Shimende. But as the saying goes, better late than never. So before the break, I was asking you about a statement you made about relationships and being in the industry that you feel that for women, as soon as the partner is known, they're taken less seriously. Can you unpack that for me? I just feel that, yeah, I'm they, uh, I think we work so hard as women to just be who mm. we are and to be recognized. And I think women, men do the same thing. Mm. But a man is never known as Mr. So-and-so, mm -hmm. uh, husband too. Mm. Uh, but a woman will exist always as, oh, well, now she's engaged. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, now she's done that. Now she's had a baby. Yeah. When will she have a baby? Yes. Because the baby belongs to the country. Yeah. It's no longer just yours. Yeah. But a man's baby doesn't belong to the country. Yeah. A man's business belongs to himself. In fact, I actually celebrate companies where they give the man a baby shower because yeah. why not give equal rights in yeah. that respect? Yeah. Because we want our men to be fathers as much as our mothers are mothers. Oh. So let's do that. But I still think it's not equal for the women in terms of the business side of mm. it. And so I think it's, it's sad that we have to stand alone. And I feel like if the relationship falls apart, and it would be public if people know who you're dating. Then you fail to do something yes, as a woman. Yes, then, then it's like yeah. it, it, it follows you around. You are the one who got cheated on, you know. Also, any decision you make. Yes. Like, if you are a gay woman, oh, yeah. well, maybe that's why she likes sports. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you, whatever. And if you dress, like, in a skimpy way, exactly. I mean, how can she do that? You know, she should be dressing like that just for her men. Uh, exactly. And like, wow, yeah. relax <laughs> yourselves. All right, so... 
have you ever considered doing anything besides acting? Uh, I've thought about fashion. I've thought about radio. Mm -hmm. And I've thought about producing the work that I do, television and film. Uh -huh. But when I think about anything outside of my given career, I would possibly be a psychologist. That is what I would enjoy outside of this. It's related, but that's, oh. that's the next thing that I, would, that I would look at. And what tough lessons has the industry taught you? <laughs> Yo, you had, I don't know if you're going to give me the answer you thought about when your eyes did that. I'd really like you to. Um, well, actually, I was just thinking about it because I think people have been kind. So I'm trying to unpack the truth behind the kindness. Ah. Um, I think one of the hardest lessons about the industry, uh, people always go to privacy, of course, mm -hmm. and now not being able to just move around anonymously. Um, but I would have to say support for one another mm. um, as men or women. Mm -hmm. I think when you arrive at a space, I don't think it should matter what platform you're on. I don't think that should be what gives you entrance into someone's heart or mind. Uh -huh. I think what you do, I mean, I hate when people say, how old are you? What do you do? Where do you come from? Because that takes away from just my soul. Yeah. And I feel that in the industry, we do that to each other, except you wanna box people. not caring. Yeah. H how old are you? What do you do? Where do you come from? Oh, okay. You fit there. Next. You fit there. Yeah. But we shouldn't be asking each other that. We should just be supporting that we arrived together. We're mm. in the space together. The platform where we met mm. is important enough. And the fact that we're raising the South African flag, South African industry as artists, that should be enough. Mm. It shouldn't be you did it like this or you did it like that, therefore you are better. So I think that's one of the things that I struggle with in the industry. Okay. So you have named 2017 the year of the children. Yeah. I know there's something you're doing in the free state about dramatic children. Tell me about it. Yeah, I have um, a group of children that I work with uh, under the organization Dramatic Need. Dramatic Need. I said dramatic children. Well, they are dramatic oh, children. Okay. <laughs> like, I just they, saw tantrums. <laughs> well, they are dramatic, artistic. Uh, uh -huh. We have visual artists, uh, painters. We have children who are studying the, the acting form and who are aspiring directors and fashion designers. So they're all high school uh, students at the moment. Yeah. And what we would like to do and what we want to do as an organization is to invite art practitioners so if you're at home and you're listening and oh. you feel that you are a strong director, a strong producer, a strong writer, a strong designer, yeah. and you want to come and teach our children and offer a workshop and offer the tools, your tools, mm -hmm. that's what we're looking for. And from Dramatic Need and from that organization in the village of Ramalotsi in the Free State yeah. is where the children's monologues were born. And what the children's monologues are is um, obviously monologues and a series of stories that have come out of the organization since 2010. And it is the children's stories that come out from writing workshops. So it's how they process their violence, their trauma, whatever mm. stories they want mm -hmm. to tell. And that work has been translated into monologues by British, Australian, New York writers. And for the first two, they were performed at the Royal Court in London mm -hmm. and directed by Danny Boyle, Academy Award winning Danny Boyle. Slumdog. Slumdog. <laughs> Slumdog Danny. And so he's the trustee of our organization. He's a trustee okay. of our organization, friend of our organization. And the CEO is a woman named Amber Sainsbury, who is a British New Zealand okay, actress. Okay, so give me the website because we have to go. Dramaticneed.org uh -huh. and Dramatic Need on Instagram and on Twitter mm -hmm. and Facebook, Dramatic Need Community. She, thank you for your time and just your aura, just yourself. Well, thank I, you I for mean, yours. Please I mean, I learned, I learned a lot today. So to all the ladies who prefer the other you, well, they can go to Generations, okay? They can watch Generations, The Legacy, Monday to Friday, 8 p.m. on SABC One. We love she. Make sure you tune in tomorrow. Guess who's here? Black coffee. Tum, 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 yeah. tum, tum, tum. For now, though, have yourselves a great evening. Thank you for joining us. Bye.